Notice that all five of the members are present, also the town manager, Michael Units. Uh, please stand to the Pledge of Allegiance. Left. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all very much. Um, we have some new business we need to take care of. We have contract awards for the DPW services for uh, February 2020 through January 31st of 2021. So you have in front of you um, the bid awards recommended from Southeast Regional Services Group, and this is for um, asphalt and um, loan and crack sailing and paint, line painting, everything, uh, sidewalk construction, everything that uh, Highway Department has to do. You can see the items that we actually uh, purchase. Seeing on the bill, I a motion to approve the contract as presented. So moved. Okay. Right. Aye. And next to the uh, to declare a cruiser, I believe the 35 2011 Black Ghosted Ford Explorer is surplus. Yeah, the police department um, has taken their equipment out of this vehicle and um, have declared it surplus. Originally, uh, the fire department thought they may well take the vehicle, but they're not, so it will be put on the use of it. Any questions? Seeing that you understand a motion to declare the Cruiser 85 for the 2001 Black Ghosted Port Explorer as surplus. So moved. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, and you choose what other items do we have? If uh, we have the building commissioner here tonight and um, he just wants to give an update on the demo of the Elm Street property, uh, the old Reed and Barton, as you know, uh, Cross Street was closed for a length of time. The road is uh, open again, and the uh, only person just wants to give an update. Does everyone have uh, this so you can uh, tell what he's talking about? Mr. Chairman, the board. So the uh, demolition of the uh, buildings along Elm Street were complete uh, on time and on budget. We just received the final invoice this morning. No cost overruns. That's, uh, that's a good report. Um, the concerns with the buildings down the far end were uh, realized when the uh, crane operators actually told me that they just crumbled as soon as they were touched. So uh, we were lucky we got them down before the winter snows. So it's, uh, the road has been opened, as Mr. Eunice has stated. Uh, the site is secured. I boarded up the first floor for uh, no one can enter. Uh, guardrails were placed on the second. We made moved some chain link over to the other side to uh, protect the uh, open pile that was left by the EPA. Some people were dumping illegally. Uh, I've walked the site with the CEC uh, mid-demo, and I'm going to walk it again next week now that the site is cleared. Um, as an update for the EPA, they're continuing their work out back. They're doing removing the uh, overburden to get to the uh, oil-laden soil out back on the uh, waterfront. Um, they're looking to uh, move their trailer to where the cross street buildings work, and they're going to move a pole in so they can get power out to their frack tanks out back. They're also receiving bids to take down a section of Building A, which is where the current trailer sits along Elm Street. So um, that's nothing official yet, but there is, but they have concerns of the remote fill oil line that runs underneath that building that was connected to the two underground tanks, the 20 and a 10,000 uh, gallon tank, and the oil has migrated back along that oil line. So they now want to take down a section of the building at no cost in the town at this point. So. Um, that's my update, Mr. Chairman. Any questions or questions? Yeah. Um, said building A. What, what is that on the diagram? There's just numbers. Um, those numbers, uh, it's the dark blue. I don't know those numbers, but um, four. building four. Building four along Elm, yes. That's where the current trailer is situated. So they'll be looking to take down about 50% of that building. And there's not a problem taking down 
part the partial building? I know we've had that conversation in the past. No, we can put end wall bracing up, a couple of diagonals, and then clear, clear up that uh, that section of the building is a slab and just one level. So it would just be the uh, the roof and the walls. Um, there's money left in the there's fifty thousand left from the bankruptcy court. So they'll be doing the abatement on the exterior. The DEP will be using up the funds for that. And the um, EPA is looking to extend the ceiling on the 3.4 to, um, to go over. Um, again, uh, nothing is official. We're waiting for a final word from the EPA on that. Thank you. Absolutely. Any other questions? Have a good night. Thank you, Chris. Chris. Just on the uh, construction for the Blue Star uh, Park, the sewer line going down uh, East Main Street, they've been moving along quick. Um, they're almost to the highway now, so uh, the detour will be ending uh, shortly. And uh, I think uh, the police did a great job with that detour. There didn't seem to be that much disruption. Hopefully everything was okay by the school. Thank you for that. And then we'll get ready in the spring. We'll have to have another meeting in the spring for the Route 123 project uh, with the new contractor for that whole project. We'll see what timelines and detours we're going to have on that, but nothing yet. And just on the water treatment plant, they've started testing water through. Uh, one well has been um, connected and gone through the treatment plant. They've been out there with the uh, state DEP testing that this week to see how it's going and looking to add uh, two more wells to uh, to the treatment plant. And uh, in February, they expect to have that up and uh, running totally. So uh, the Water Sewer Commission has said that they will come to our first meeting in February, February 6th to talk about uh, bringing our engineers to talk about the treatment plan and uh, what the future is for that. Mike, can I just ask a question? Didn't we through capital vote to um, start to upgrade some of the pipes we in did. the ground? Right, so yeah. that is happening, um, correct? Pine Street, Right. Um, I know was one. I'm trying to remember what, what the other one was, but I know Pine Street. I know, I can't remember what, what I thought we went well with. well on Pine Street down the plain. Right, okay. On behalf of the school committee, I'd like to call to order the joint meeting of the school committee, board of selectmen, and the finance committee. It's up to you folks. Chairs can decide which way you want to go on the agenda items. It's up to you folks. We typically. Mr. Brandlaw, why don't you start? Uh, my 
name is Kevin Morley. Uh, I'm interested in the open position of the Permanent Building Committee. I believe everyone, did everyone receive uh, yes. the letters of interest and the resumes? Ryan here. Okay. If you have more resumes of something to get. Does anyone have a position to get to this one? Two minor positions. Oh. Yeah. Uh, you want to tell us a little bit about what you've done? Maybe you said. We've been involved in different stages of the construction industry for about 50 years. Um, the, the last 10, 15 years, let's have a look back. Right now, I've been working as a consultant to charity industries. Prior to that, I was with National Mother for 10 years um, as the running the EWP division, um, started up their framing division, um, retired from there. Prior to that, this was Sells Green Building Company, I was a purchasing agent and chief estimator. Prior to that, I was on my own with Construction and Consulting Services uh, Incorporated. Um, while there, uh, I spent three years in Buffalo, New York, great place to be. Um, working for Wausau Insurance, um, largest contractor in the Niagara Frontier. Um, rolled over, and myself and another fellow went on to complete all the work that was out there. The remaining contract balances were about 200. And 25 million. We ended up spending close to a billion dollars uh, because of all the corrective work and stuff that had to be done because of shoddy work and chip. Um, while there, we did uh, U.S. Customs Plaza uh, at Niagara Falls, Roswell Park, uh, Cancer Research Institute, uh, hospital sewage treatment plants, water treatment plants. A little bit of everything. Uh, prior to that, I was with uh, Grossman's Lumber for uh, 20, 20 some odd years. Uh, while there, I was you know, their resident architect, uh, did all the design work. Uh, what else? Uh, done a little bit of everything throughout the years that I've been. Uh, so, well, what makes you want to join the uh, permanent public committee? I don't know. I think I have some expertise that I like, think can help the town. Hopefully. Can you elaborate, elaborate on that a bit? Centers, uh, you know, it's, it's I'm good with project manuals. I can read through, uh, read in between the lines. Uh, and, uh, I'm good with numbers. You know, that was, you know, the gist of what I've done for a good part of my career is being an estimator. Uh, 
cost estimating for both materials and labor. You know, I think you can help along those lines to make sure that the end is correct. What do you think would be the most enjoyable part of being on that committee? Getting out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot of other vacancies, too. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, it gets away from my uh, routine. Yeah. 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 Ye
but my background certainly adds to that. Um, not only design and the, um, in contracts, but communicating between the two and actually how to bid stuff. It's one of the things in this business I think there's a lack of is how to bid a project. So a lot of things we'll see in design drawing documents you can't quantify. If you can't quantify, you can't you can't bid. It's a simple fact. And if if you can eliminate those, I think you have a lot of less a lot less headaches with the contractors later on down the road. Because they all have it in their back pocket. They know where the chain goes up. They don't tell you until it shows up. It's the game. We've all played it. Deal with it every day. <coughs> So, I think um, Renee, that you had asked uh, Mr. Morley the question of what what do you think you can bring to the current <coughs> committee right now, um, where so much has already been done. Um, just kind of, what do you think you can bring? Well, I mean, it's, I think it's the same as when you take a new job; you jump in midstream. You know, just evaluate everything where it is and what your goals are, and try and figure out if you're on that path. Like I said, I get a lot of design experience, a lot of contracting experience. I think. In, Fill in some gaps, maybe, uh, maybe the voice of reason. If there's some disagreements between those kind of people. Um, I've also done a lot of uh, did two um, five five year plans, if you will. One for the town of Maynard. We assessed all the buildings in the town, so I'm very familiar with you know, prioritizing needs. I also did a uh, with Massport, the Worcester Airport, did the same kind of thing. So. I think that's one of the things that I would like to bring is look, let's go get a five-year plan, maybe the first one, maybe the first one, I don't know. But if not, at least help develop one or just give my feedback on it, stuff like that. Okay, thank you. One more? So, so what do you think about, um, I mean, we talked a bit about the bigger projects and, and, you know, your experience, but what do you think about those projects that aren't as sexy? Like, one of the things that, um, we recently approved it. A town meeting was for an envelope. Am I saying that right? An envelope study. Mm -hmm. um, like, what about that? Like, how? Where does your interest lie in, in the group overall? Well, I think all projects are important. Um, an envelope study, even though it might be small, is very important for building maintenance issues and sustainability of the building. So I don't. I don't say any project is less important than anything else. It's kind of small fish here. For us, sometimes political motivations make one more high priority than another. But I treat them all the same. That'd be fair. You know, everybody everybody wants to have their pet project built. You know, whether it's a school, town hall, fire station, you work on all of them, I kinda get it. Give everybody a shot. Be fair to everybody. That's all. Don't take it personal. Just a project. All right, thank you. No. Nope. We're here from two candidates. I don't know if you're not speaking on yourselves, or is everyone ready to go? Can I ask a question? We actually had a third candidate, but we don't have his information in here. <coughs> Jack already is a selectman's rep. He's a selectman's rep, but he submitted an application to for the, the permanent seat. I'm just wondering why we don't have the application. I, I, Not sure if you're interested at this point, but yeah, I, I think we have two very qualified candidates. I'm perfectly fine to maintain the selectman seat, but I just put my name forward. I'd like to hear uh, from the chair, the PBC. I don't know if she had an opportunity to speak to either applicant. Good evening. I did have an opportunity to, uh, to speak with both of the candidates. They both seem like very well qualified individuals. Um, I think the committee is looking for someone who can join us as we go down this journey to make a selection sites to recommend to the building committee. We're looking for someone who is able to work as a committee member with an already established committee, as Canada mentioned, jumping in midstream, but being able to participate as a uh, committee member. The role of the committee is to advise the selectmen and the 
school committee on your construction projects. We will be going out to bid, hopefully, in the summer for a town hall, council on aging, possibly a school project. And we need someone who is able to work with us as a committee member and is willing to be a committee member. Um, it's not our role to get down into the weeds and figure out how to do it. It's our role to step back three cases and be able to advise the uh, selectmen and school committee on how the projects are going and to present it to a town meeting. So I think both of them would be capable of doing that. We have one individual with a long history of working with the town. We have another individual who is very interested in getting involved in the town, you know, to get family here and is looking to get involved for the better of the community. So I would not want to make their choice. <laughs> Thank you. But if you had to. <laughs> Jack. <laughs> He doesn't have an application then, so Jack, that'll be fine. Okay. Um, no one objects, I guess we could go to a vote. Um, who wants to go, who wants to go first? <laughs> do we just say who we think we want as I, I would. Or do we do it privately? Or? Can't do private. Can't do private. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, in, in, in the past, when we've done votes, we usually one one at a time and indicated who we chose. And technically, once one person gets majority, the voting can stop. Okay. That, that means if we start at that end, we might not have to cut. <laughs> <laughs> or if we start at that end. <laughs> So, well, I'll, I'll, I will start as our, our chair. Uh, my vote is for uh, Brian, and I'm just going to say B because I know I'm going to butcher your last name. Brian, right, for she. Thank you. For she. I will also vote for Brian. Um, <clears throat> I think that we have two um, good candidates. I appreciate both of them stepping forward. I know um, it does take time away from family, so we certainly appreciate that. I think just based on um, history and, um, you know, I, I think the comment that got me was a five-year plan for our towns. Um, I, I like to hear that for our building, so with that, I'm going to also vote for Brian. Um, I vote for Mr. Shea as well. So I, well, I think we have great candidates. Um, I do, and, and I look forward to the opportunity um, for whomever doesn't make it to become involved in other town uh, positions, because there are, I was joking earlier, we have several open, and I know, um, you know, even just serving on the IDC, there are times where we are struggling for, our, for folks to join. So there are a lot of um, great opportunities out there. So I, I think that with both of their skill sets, they would um, both be valuable, but I also will vote for Ryan as well. I echo the sentiment of Renee and Sherry. Um, I appreciate everybody coming forward to volunteer. It's a hard thing to come uh, put yourself out there for, especially in a room like this tonight. So thank you both. Um, I'm going to vote for Brian just because I think, based on what I heard tonight and the projects that we have uh, going forward, his uh, skill set is probably the best right now. But um, I hope that Mr. Morley will consider maybe uh, volunteering on one of our other boards or commissions in town because he certainly do have a lot of experience that I think could benefit the town in other ways. Yeah, and I'm kind of going to follow the trend here. Having worked with Mr. Mache on the High School Building Committee for uh, a number of years, uh, I've seen him in, in action. I think he'd be a good asset. Is there, um, is there a, an alternate position on the Permanent Building Committee? Because I think the perspective would still be good. Uh, and I don't know if that is something that was set up. I haven't read I'm looking at the bylaw. I know it was in here somewhere. But, uh, because I think Mr. Morley would certainly contribute good uh, counsel and advice. Um, so, if, if, if one, if you'd be willing to do it, and two, if there's a, a position available for an alternate member, um, I, I don't think. It would. At this point in time, um, all the members <coughs> are appointed by the board of selectmen to represent the project which directly impacts their department. So, currently, we have a representative from the Council on Aging who is with us to advise on that issue and to vote on that part of the project. We also have a representative from the Board of Selectmen who 
advises us and votes on the town hall part of the project. That's the only mechanism to have alternative members. We do welcome the public, and we do have a moment in our meetings to provide public comment. Then actually school committee as well. Oh, school, yeah. That's all right. I'm sorry. That's all right. <laughs> School committee as well. Sherry sits with us on the school committee as their representative. Currently, I'm not a school committee. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, miss, I missed one meeting. <laughs> Bonnie is with us for the finance committee, but that's the only mechanism that's yep. provided to bylaws. Okay. There, there is actually ex officio members. They're non voting. Yeah, non voting. Uh, yeah. For each project, the CBC may request the appointment of staff or other town residents with particular expertise to advise the committee. Any such request shall be made to the town manager, provided however that the, with respect to the school department personnel, such requests shall be made to the superintendent of the schools. And I think that, that is gives us Bob and you and Sherry. That references your your appointments. The ex officio members. I thought that's the temporary members. Yes, for the temporary members. I thought they were both one and the same. Two separate. Very well. But it's interesting. The temporary member says for each non school project, and the other one just says for each project. Well, the non school projects are the town hall council foundation, and the school project is uh, Sherry's representative. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. It was my understanding in the spirit of clarity and openness that the last three people that were talked about as far as the Board of Selectmen representative and the school committee representative and, and finance, committee. Mm -hmm. finance committee finance committee that they were appointed as liaisons so that the, those respective committees would get information at their every meeting so they were like liaison Appointments. They weren't met. They were non-voting liaison, so that those committees would get knowledge. Um, like Jack comes back to the selectmen's meeting and gets questions about what goes on at the building committee. And I'm having not watched the school committee meetings or the um, <coughs> finance committee meetings. I don't know if that also happens. But this, if the selectmen have a direct question that night of the meeting they go to their liaison who has been appointed by their respective committees. <coughs> and that was always my feeling. And there's no, no way written down where it says that happens. It was just done, I believe, for the sake of clarity because people were not informed about what was going on. They didn't know what this was happening and what this was happening, even though we were giving, you know, updates whenever somebody wanted one but they felt that it was better to have a liaison from their committee present to know what was going on so that if somebody had a question that person sat in on the meeting as a non-voting member and gave their report yeah um, so other than the five members that are on the board as Diana said, for each project. So, if the town for the town hall project, for example, um, Jack is appointed as a temporary member, and Jack has a right to vote on the town hall project only. And for the COA project, the COA has a representative who is the temporary member and can vote on the COA project only. And for a school project, you would have a temporary member who could vote on the school project only. The ex officios <coughs> are if um, they want to have uh, the building inspector come to the meetings to talk on something, or if they want to have Wade come on um, systems in the schools that they're upgrading, then <coughs> they could appoint Wade as an ex officio member, but he would have no voting. Rights. So I guess the bottom line is, is if we wanted to create alternates, we would have to make a change to the bottom line. That's a seven point eight. So 
My vote is is worthless, but I'm I'm very happy that both gentlemen uh, came and volunteered, and I also uh, was on the school building committee with Brian and found him to be very knowledgeable. And uh, in, in the in the spirit of unity, I'll vote for Brian if for no other reason but to make him happy. Agenda is the FY21 uh, budget discussion. So, um, for the sake of the public, uh, myself, uh, Mike, uh, James, uh, the accountant, and Matt Wells, our business manager for the schools, have uh, been meeting. Uh, we've had three meetings uh, thus far. We plan to meet again as soon as the, we get a little bit more information in terms of uh, the state numbers. Um, we've had some good discussions, uh, positive discussions, friendly discussions, uh, talking state priorities. Um, talking to see uh, long-term um, our needs, I present our needs uh, in terms of priorities, most of them around mandates, uh, areas of special education and ELL that are continue to be a concern. Um, in terms of the, the general budget, um, we are currently, uh, or all the budget, we are currently in negotiations with the teachers union and the parents union. Um, they are combining as one group under the Mass Teachers Association. Um, those negotiations have started. Um, and um, financials um, haven't uh, come to the forefront yet. Uh, a lot of language because we're bringing two contracts together um, into one. Um, so that's where we're at. Um, we, we've seen the negotiations are going well, and I, I think we'll get something to the table and done, and hopefully um, by the time the town meeting comes around. Um, we, I've spoken with Michael um, about contracts that have been settled. Um, any, any on their side, any on my side, and just to take a look at what those numbers mean and the impact. And um, from the school side, uh, I think it's it's been an opportunity, something we really haven't done in the past. Um, and I think it's uh, hopefully will allow for us to maybe even um, come to the finance committee um, with more of a, um, if you will, a balanced budget um, so that it can be reviewed by the finance committee and, and difficult decisions can be made. Um, I think lastly, um, there's a lot of talk about the Student Opportunity Act. Uh, you might have been reading about it. Um, you will be one of the 40 to 60 districts in the state that will receive limited amounts of money. Um, you're talking about $35 per student, um, which we have, what it's basically what we've seen for the last three years. We're about $75,000, unless there's some real surprises that come our way. Uh, the two that we're waiting for, um, that we just don't have confidence in, to be quite honest, as superintendents throughout the state, and that is the, f the funding of special education transportation. That has never been part of the formula for the circuit breaker. Um, that would be a six-figure significant number for us. Um, and that, so that means a reimbursement process um, uh, like the, uh, um, the um, circuit breaker is, if you will, where we receive a percentage of that money uh, for transporting students out of district um, to other communities um, for their services. Uh, that has never been part of the foundation of the circuit breaker, so that could be a changer for a lot of communities that are not going to see um, the opportunities that other districts are. Um, the last part of it is that, remember, it's an FY21 through 27 number, so you're going to see these wonderful numbers out there, like 500,000 divided by seven years. Um, there are cities that are getting in the vicinity of $111 million over the course of those years. Um, most of the formula is geared towards uh, uh, poverty um, and second language acquisition. Those are the two major areas um, where the funding formula is supporting. So the ELL student population, um, just to let you know, um, I sat this, this past week with my staff uh, when I started, here, we, we had 17 ELL students in the district. We, as of this year, are 62 and growing. 
will, it will require another staff member because we have to provide direct services and we do very well with that population of students but that just tells you a little bit of a of a shift that's taking place if you take that number and now you multiply it in a significantly bigger district you're talking about hundreds of students um, in shifts that are taking place yes sir uh, what's ELL English language learners okay so they would be the second language learners these are students um, whose first language um, is not English or and or the first language within the home um, it's a growing population in this area um, it, it's just a matter of, of what we're seeing throughout the state in southeastern Massachusetts um, and it's predominantly being seen um, as students that are actually um, buying the properties in Norton, uh, renting in Norton, being part of the Norton community. Um, so that's a significant uh, growth, growth uh, over the next few years. I don't know if somebody else had any questions. Um, and then um, really the one that steps outside of all of this, and that is um, a real uh, concern that we continue to have around social emotional learning, uh, what we would call back in my day mental health. Um, it is a spiking, rising, significant issue in Norton, not only in other communities, it is here. Um, we are dealing um, with significant issues around vaping. If, if any of you have uh, been reading the uh, local news and the papers, including here in Norton, um, and we need to, to uh, put not only programming in place, but bodies in place. Uh, so that's a concern because there's a cost that comes with that. Um, <coughs> The last part is um, really working with um, Chief Clark. Um, you'll see a capital uh, item uh, that's coming from the police department, so warning the school department around the flashing lights around the schools for safety so that we can have people slow down around some of our schools, very much like we have at some of the other schools already. Um, and then I think the last part um, is really the school resource officer. Um, I can't tell you how important um, that uh, position has become. Uh, we've added a position here at the middle school. They are now splitting time at the elementary schools for the first time on a regular basis. Um, we actually had our, our SRO was out on medical and our other SRO that day actually had to deal with two in different incidents going on two different schools. Um, we had, as you know, a situation here where we had live ammunition on school grounds. I can't tell you as a superintendent how proud this community should be of the way it was responded to by not only your police department, um, but the community as a whole. Um, you know, we just didn't get a lot of negative news about it because I think we dealt with it. Our SRO and police force were at the homes of uh, these situations and, um, and it was a team effort. Um, and then last night, we're in the middle of a winter concert and we have to call the fire department because somebody uh, faints. Uh, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's constant and without them, we couldn't do it, so we, we echo that and I think the uh, the third department I always mention because if I don't, I it would always get back to me because I can't do it without him and that's Keith in the highway department because when those snow mountains start getting high, <laughs> without him I can't open school. So um, those are all things that um, are working well on our side and I'll defer to Mike uh, for your comments. As Joe said, you know, we'll be getting together soon. Uh, one of the big things obviously with our budget is health insurance and so as Joe said, you know, we're looking to see what some of the state numbers are, but we're also uh, hope to have uh, by the end of January, beginning of February, uh, the number of what our health insurance will be going up next year, which is a big part of the budget. So that'll help us along further in our planning. I think just to, I just wanted to mention because I know we talked about it at one of our last joint meetings. I just want to thank uh, Mike, Joe, and Matt, and, and James um, for taking the time. I know it's one more meeting that you guys you know have to attend, but I do think it's helpful um, to have the open communication between um, you know the, the town and the schools. And so I just want to thank you guys for um, attending yet another meeting. Well, we're thankful for it, and uh, James is buying uh, lunch the next I meeting, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to it. Um, Dollar Man. <laughs> 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 so, so, yeah. Are there any other questions or comments? Uh, you know, one thing, uh, Dr. I mentioned um, the response of Norton Police to the various incidents. So today happens to be uh, National Law, Law Enforcement Appreciation Day, so I think it's a great day to acknowledge all that they've done for our community. Because the last year, uh, we were found one of the safest uh, 
the first or second state. Yeah. Second. Second. Right. state. Yeah. Second. Um, so that's a great testament to Chief Clark and his officers. So I just want to thank them for all that they do. Well said. We'll turn it over to the Finance Committee. Hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't have anything really prepared to, to talk about, per se. Um, I do appreciate that the town and the school um, leadership, uh, you know, getting together and trying to hash out uh, a budget for the next three to five years that then I think we can work with to try to show the townspeople where we think this town is going. And I think up until this point, we've just kind of been shooting in the dark. And at least from my perspective, the, the fact that we're actually trying to get something together should make our annual budget process hopefully a little easier to get through, a little easier for, for the townspeople to understand um, and whether it's, you know, the information out there and we'll be able, the townspeople will then be able to make decisions that I think we're going to be asking them to make in the near future. That's really all, you know, I, I can say on this topic at this point. things you'll see on this slide I, I won't go into great detail um, under the purposes and objectives but certainly you know like I said I, I took feedback from this and put it together to talk about you know how do we get to a point where we can improve um, the preparations for town meeting how do we get the accurate and timely information that we need and not only to us but back out to the residents um, I, I spoke with several people after the last meeting and the comments were you know we, we didn't understand what was in front of us there were a lot of things that were being discussed being motion from the floor um, I think the, the one positive point that that I heard out of that was when we had town council stand up somebody had asked you know can you just explain it in layman's terms and so she stood up and she explained it and that that was really well received so how do we get to a point of you know we talk about this stuff for hours and we eventually get all that information out but then we sit at that table and nobody really understands that we've had these conversations so how do we <coughs> get it and provide them with a nice summary that they can understand so they know the impact of the different articles that are coming for them um, but again you know I think that we have a lot of opportunities to really work <coughs> together um, the process you know right now the the warrants closing in February the meetings not until May I think it gives us again it's probably going to add some meetings onto all of our schedules but I think 
Um, and I certainly will take your opinions and, and input, but I think it's going to be um, beneficial to the town and beneficial to us and not only being clear but understanding really what are we improving, what are we putting in front of people and um, you know, what information can we get out beforehand to, uh, to inform folks. So with that, um, on the third page of this, there's a timeline and I apologize, I, I actually did this in color so you can see it a little easier, but um, you don't have a color printer that can print 30 copies that quickly. Um, so if we could just take, take a moment to go through this. I, I did a little legend down at the bottom. Um, anything that's in a solid block is a bylaw reference. Um, if it has, and you'll see I, I also have some numbers too. So bylaws would be uh, labeled with a, a superscript of one and then chart anything coming from the charters of two. And then Mike was kind enough to send me a list that he goes through from the town meeting. And that is, um, it's the, what would you call that? Like a, an equal dash line, not the dash, like a long dash and then a, a short dash. Um, so some of these things I had, oh, it's Morse hard. code. Morse code, yes. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll do the clicks here in a second. Um, so some, there are a couple things that I had some questions on. Um, and then I put in some things you'll see at, at the bottom. And it's hard to see because it's actually, um, I labeled it in the legend as the right thing to do. And that's, I think, more of our discussion items on can we have some sessions together? How do we approach this so that we do get that information in front of us? We have an opportunity to speak to the people who are, are you know, essentially like the department heads who are, are coming before, um, you know, Mike or the other folks. and having that chance to talk to them to figure out, you know, when we're looking at something, what does it really mean? And, and not assuming that, you know, or, or feeling like we don't have an opportunity to find out. Um, so if I look on the far left, the, in the timeline, um, Mike, this is a question for you because I, I know in the bylaw, it talks about the article closing um, at least 90 days prior to the meeting. And we picked a day that's 96 days out. I didn't know, like, is it standard that we're not keeping it closer to the 90 and, and giving folks more time to actually submit more articles? It, it just had to do, I think there were holidays in there. It's, yeah, so the, so the, um, February 12th, I think, is a Wednesday, and then that next Monday is the holiday, but the 18th is, is the 90th day, which is the day after. So, I mean, I just, I feel like, and I don't know that we've <coughs> actually publish this any, anywhere, but I feel like the more time that we can provide to people to be able to submit information in respect to the, the article list that might be better for us as well as them. Um, the other thing that I found too is under that, um, in the charter, it references that when the Board of Selectmen receives a submitted article, that has to be forwarded to uh, the finance committee, town moderator, and town clerk. And I think it said, um, I think it said within five days, but I'll have to double check that. But I, I don't know that that's something that we're doing. I don't ever remember seeing, I, I know nothing came to us. I actually, I think I got the article list last year from FinCom. I didn't get it internally through the board. So that's certainly an uh, item I think that we can probably improve upon to make sure that everybody's informed. <coughs> In front of me, I have uh, this, which is this. Yep. And I also have like a little timeline sheet. I don't know where yep. this came from. So this is this is really clear to me. Yes. This is. I know because this has a lot. This is so this that's complicated. It <laughs> is, and it doesn't look as complicated when it's in color. Um, we just don't have a way to. If we could display it, I could certainly put it up, and I can send it electronically. So let me explain what that is. So the sheet that you have on the left. Right, those are the things that Mike had provided that are in here as being town manager reference. Okay. There are other items that are coming from the charter and the bylaw that we either don't address now or we need to make sure that, that we're aware that we have requirements around that. So it's bring it all together. And then there's a section about in between that, what can we do collectively to make sure that we all are in a position where we can get the information that we need to make a more informed decision. I don't disagree with that, but this this is hard. Sure. If I, I, I wanted to look at a timeline, I don't know. Even if it was color, I wouldn't know which box to look at first. Yeah. I'm just. I know I, it's I, probably I, with space and stuff. Maybe. Sure. I don't know. Maybe if you kind of. I can put it in an Excel. Combine the two yeah, or something. Okay. I don't yeah. know. I'm just I'm just saying like I was looking at it. Go wow. Sure. Yeah. There's a lot of there's a lot on there. Okay. Yeah. 
there was more on there because I, I didn't expect to, to pull much information from the charter bylaw that wasn't already in Mike's, and, and Mike had some things that weren't in either as well. So we can certainly, I mean, you know, it's up to you guys if you want to have some detailed conversation on it. We can go through the timeline, looking at what our, um, what the expectations are, and at what point, you know, there's an expectation that there's more engagement and more discussion on the word articles. I find it to be very helpful having this. I don't know that I have much input on the dates and all of that stuff because I, I kind of look to you guys for, for that part of it. Um, but just for a knowledge, for our own knowledge, I find it to be helpful. And, you know, it's funny the different ways that people interpret things. I looked at this and I was like, ah, oh, this is great. I can follow right along and know. So I think it's all interpretation. Yeah, I think it's great. I, I, I like what it is, but I couldn't follow it in terms of the yeah. timeline. When I was thinking timeline, the boxes don't. Yeah. Maybe if it was turned this way and it was on a couple different pages and it's a timeline I could follow as each box goes down the timeline. That's, that's all. That yeah. But I'm it is not, helpful. So thank you for putting that together. Yeah. 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 And then I did, did we can get past the format. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you put this together in hopes of not having changes on the floor during the middle of the meeting? Yes. Is that, yes. yes. Okay. Because that was really chaotic last yep. meeting. Yeah, and that, I mean, that was the biggest feedback. Well, even, I mean, even before the meeting, right? Like, we, we end up meeting before the meeting. I believe FinCom, you may have changed one of your recommendations. So the other thing is, too, is FinCom's, you know, providing recommendations. And one of the improvements I did like, and I didn't put in here, but, you know, I, I hope that we can do it again, is we actually listed columns on there that showed how, how FinCom um, voted on an item, how the yeah. board selectman did, and then how the planning board did. Yeah. And I thought that was helpful for people to see. But the one thing that was pretty apparent is, FinCom voted for some, we did not, right? And then planning board didn't vote for one and both board of selectmen and FinCom did, right? So I think those are things that, I think it's fine if the boards don't agree, but I think it's better to know that before we are sitting down and decisions are changed right before the meeting and we have printed materials. I mean, and you can see people who flip through there and they're like, like this is what, what he's reading is not what's sitting in front of me. Right, right. I also think it's helpful for people in the audience because I think people come to town meeting and, and they look to their leaders to help guide them through that process. So if they see that the FinCom and the Board of Selectmen voted for something that somebody else didn't, it, it kind of flags, well, why, you know, why is the vote different? You know, and I think it prompts some questions that probably need to be asked rather than just kind of going with, you know, what's on the paper because, you know, it, it's a lot of meetings we all sit through. We understand the back and forth and, you know, but for people who are just attending town meeting, it's a lot to try to figure out in a very short right. period of time. Yeah. I, I think I, I, like the, I like the idea of the timelines. I think when you can do your gap analysis and figure out where things are with different interpretations from charters, etc. But one of the things I definitely agree with you is there shouldn't be any last minute meetings. Five minutes before a town meeting when we're talking about a bylaw change, a charter change, something and we go up there unprepared and sound like we're unprepared. Yeah. Those are the kind of things I think we all have to get together to avoid. We don't look good. We're not putting a good product in front of our town for them to vote on important things related to our town. Right, right. Yeah, my position would be we don't have a meeting before the finance committee doesn't meet before the town meeting. Whatever is in the warrant is in the warrant. In the bottom of the ninth, they come in with some big change. That's where you'll see we voted for something in a planning board did using that as an example. Okay? The reason they didn't is when they came before us, they didn't have enough information. We voted no action. Okay, right. you followed suit, but it looks like a blank on the other people saying, what's going on? Did we lose something somewhere? And then the planning board or whatever, whatever something tries to explain it, we don't know what they're talking about because they didn't have the information before us. So my position would be, no meetings before the town meeting. Done. If it isn't in the warrant, if it isn't documented by everybody, then it doesn't exist. Because that's what happens, and that's, it's been, I've been on a committee maybe too long, 30 plus years, and it's always that way. At the bottom of the night, somebody comes in and says, oh, but by the way, we forgot to say this. Well, if you forgot, it doesn't exist. The town meeting starts at seven, there's nothing before that. When we have our last meeting and they go, what are it's posted? It's posted. That's done. Then we don't look like a bunch of fools. Seriously. <laughs> yeah, it's just an echo on that. We've had a lot of um, 
um, collective agreement bar bargain, you know, bargaining agreements brought to us <coughs> right before the town meeting. And, you know, we're, we're in a position that, you know, would just either stop the whole process or, you know, we just, you know, vote to, uh, to go ahead with it. So that is a very important thing for us. And it always it has been for some time. So we talk a lot about prioritization. And, like, in the charter, the Board of Selectmen owns the warrant. And I think it's, it's appropriate that any article that goes through um, before it goes to you guys should be voted on at the board before it goes in. The meetings that I've been at, you guys are often asking, well, what did the board of selectmen say on this to understand the priority? And most of the time, we haven't voted on it yet. So I think we need to commit to being the ones to lead that and to set the priorities and vote according to what we see as the executive branch of this governor um, and set that priority. It's not fair to FinCon to have to try to make that judgment in a vacuum. How you guys feel about that? Right. I, I, I think Lene and I spoke because I was quite frustrated at, at the last go round that, from our perspective, everybody else should have voted already on anything on the warrants, and that their votes show up so that at our last meeting we're able to, to finish up knowing how everybody else voted. And it, it, it was out of control this, this last go round and, and it, you know, it just made for a bad impression at the meeting, having our, our <coughs> six, six o'clock meeting before the meeting, it, it was just uh, unnecessary. And, I, and I'm, I, I appreciate the work you put into this, Renee, and I, I truly hope it bears results this coming May. <coughs> Thank you. And, and, you know, while I put this down on paper, I mean, this was from feedback that I've received from everyone. So certainly, um, you know, I expect that to continue so that we can, we can put, like, some hard dates on when, when do we want to do this or what do we think we need to do, especially after we get the first list of articles and if we see something in there that's more complicated than than we expect, right? We can, we can call that out separately and, and even have a separate, you know, one hour meeting on it versus, you know, you guys have done a lot of meetings we've done, I think our longest up to this point has been like four hours and 20 minutes. I think we, we hit that and you, know, you guys have done it too and we should avoid that if we can and have a little more focus on what we need to do. Did you have some there? Yeah, I did, uh, I, I love this and I think it's also uh, will serve as a handy reference to uh, members of different boards around town in terms of knowing when they need to be have their information final and ready for us um, that you know that, that may uh, may put a little you know fire behind them to, to uh, get done what they need to get done on time if they can have it in front of them because it has been kind of a nebulous thing you know more of an idea than a, than a, than a concrete I like this, and I, I like the idea of having time to have some questions back and forth, which sometimes happens over the course of days or multiple meetings, you know, before we have to make uh, some, some of these decisions, you know, and for us to have time to have a joint, you know, meeting where, you know, we can confer and, and question each other and, and not be, be rushed, you know. When we were making decisions, you know, we were, we were trying to make decisions on this last go around, you know, regarding a little extra money for the school committee, and we were just out of time to talk to the school committee. Um, and, you know, obviously the situation with the planning board was, you know, we just, we heard from the people, members of the planning board who had voted, again, uh, for a project. We had not heard from members of the, you know, from, we had not heard from the majority of planning board members who had voted against because they were unable to attend our meeting, and then boom, town meeting happens, and, how are you going to make a decision? So I think this is uh, I, I think this is great. Let's let's get it on paper. Let's let everybody know and, and figure out you know what the right days are or you know, what the right time it is. But thank you. It's fantastic. Renee, I want to thank you as well for this. It's very very helpful. Um, Aaron touched on it, but I just want to reiterate the importance of when we have something on our agenda, an article mm -hmm. in the warrant um, that the representative, the school department head, or whatever that that article is pertaining to is at the meeting so we can
can ask the questions that we have and get all the information we need um, before we vote. Um, we're seeing a lot of that issue fall. So. Yeah, and, and I think that, you know that's one of the things too. Like I know we've done that quite a bit, um, or Mike, you know, or other others, and I think that's an opportunity for us to, to maybe have those joint meetings. So we're not calling them in three or four times at all of our different meetings, and you know now they have three meetings a week. Right. I think I think by looking at that list of articles that we can kind of group them together and and have that as an opportunity. I mean, I don't know. No, I mean our budget gets our budget gets set forth um, the eight weeks prior to um, after um, our budget workshop, and I think we hold six different budget meetings within our um, our regular meetings. Um, I think my my only concern that really I shouldn't speak to because it doesn't really impact my budget per se is collective bargaining. Um, if you're bargaining in good faith. Um, across from a union and you come to a conclusion on the on the Friday night or Thursday night before town meeting um, I guess you're deferring that agreement until the next annual town meeting uh, that's going to be a headache and a half come July 1st um, again it typically doesn't happen on my side because we have to do it within our budget proposal um, but as someone who's been an active town meeting member in another community, I've seen those collective bargaining agreements come in at Monday at 3 before a town meeting at 7. And both sides have agreed, selectmen have agreed, the other side have agreed. So how do you not act on that? So I just think that that's the one headache. Again, it doesn't really necessarily refer to me, but just as a piece of information, I guess. I, think, I agree. I think it would be beautiful to say we're not going to meet at all before a town meeting, but if there's something like that, I could say within the last five town meetings that we've had, I don't think one collective bargaining issue came up. Yeah. Less, yeah. Less, but Typically it doesn't. But I do agree. You can't just cut it off. Can't there just is an issue. Right. I'm just going to, um, just to expand on that, um, you know, when we look at the numbers, but I think each department, we could get like a little forecast or a SWOT analysis of what each department is facing, tries over in the fall, what they're facing for the new fiscal year. You know, what's the strengths, what's the weakness of each department, some opportunities, threats, um, meaning, you know, from a financial point and just from a, uh, an overview. You know, what, what what's the positives, where the, uh, adversities come in from each department. I mean, we look at the numbers each year. We know the numbers come in from 600,000. That's every year that's like repeat, repeat, repeat. But how can we build upon each department's strengths and see where their weaknesses lie? And then from that, as a finance committee, make some priorities from a, an immediate fiscal year to maybe Two, three, four years out. Because I mean, I think this chart, um, the timeline is great. You can even expand it into like a, a Gantt chart. Uh, you can even break it down and be more definitive as each action goes. Um, Are you volunteering? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll volunteer when I. Okay. Um, so that that's just you know what I'm saying. I, it, it's good. It's good. But you know the numbers are the numbers. But I think if we had some uh, narrative behind it for each department and uh, kind of put some emotional feeling into it, we can make some some judgments, and make some decisions. So what do you think for next steps? So there are some things identified on here. It sounds like. Um, Probably some additional um, collaboration is needed. Um, you know, I can certainly go back with, with a few folks, and we can come up with something and, and bring it back to the boards. It's up to you. I'm, I'm open to any ideas. Just uh, don't want to do it too late. Want to make sure that we can actually implement something this time and see if we can make some improvements quickly. So um, I mentioned this um, to Bill um, last year. I think it's time to get down and dirty on the school budget. 
to get folks to really get it. And so I'm going to recommend that a subcommittee of the Finance Committee on Education be willing to spend more than just an hour presentation and really get into the nitty gritty of our budget, question everything, so that I can have at least three to five of the 11 of you go back and understand our budget a little bit more in detail than just the bottom number, specifically around the area of mandates. I'm willing to put in the time. Um, I know my staff will support me with that. Um, because I think we need to have some, some further serious discussions about the fluidity of my budget that's very different from the town budget um, around the mandates. Um, I can guarantee you that if I have 92 teachers at the middle school and the high school in general education, that number probably isn't growing much from year to year. But when it comes to the other side of it, um, we, we have, uh, I have to here tonight for the next topic, we have 21 specialized, specialized classrooms in this district now. That wasn't around here a few years ago. Our buildings even aren't, aren't even made for these programs. So we've had to bring them together. So that's just an idea that I have uh, that collaborates a little bit with what you're trying to do um, because we have pockets of our budget that are just not understood. They become, you know, that we're, uh, we're not using the money appropriately. They become a discussion about we're uh, putting away money somewhere because last time I checked, I guess we have those accounts. And, uh, and so I propose that it's something, it's a model I came from, um, both uh, in, in my uh, days on the school committee in my hometown, um, where three members of an 18 member fin fin finance committee would come forward and we would spend hours upon hours with that group tearing apart everything. It drives the business management manager's office crazy because you're, you're getting a lot of paper, but in this day and age of electronics, it could easily, I think, be done a lot easier. People can sit at home, come to the next meeting with questions about why are we doing this, how come it's costing so much to do that, um, or, and also say, um, and get more specifics on, on the school budget. So I'm putting that out there for further discussion. I see interested eyes. <laughs> I'm interested. <laughs> Good. I'll, I'll, I'll include the Board of Selectmen and Mike, sure. um, the, the, the school committee, um, on potential dates once our budget is published, um, that we can we can do that. Of course, all of the FinCom, we could hold it as a public meeting um, if you have a majority. If not, if you have, don't have a majority, then we open up a conference room and start going through it line by line. I think there'd probably be value even if there's not a quorum of any board to have that be a, a public area. Happy how, to do it. With how often the school budget comes up as a bone of contention in yep. this town, yep. I think having it be as open as transparent as we typically are uh, will be all the better. Happy to do it. Thank you. Mike, anything? You want to add? Nope. Um, just along with that, we also uh, uh, presented to you um, a look at going out through 2024 where we've started looking at budgets as we go along. And as you can see in that presentation, if we increase the budgets at 3% each year, we, we're just not going to have the revenue to continue that. And you can see that as, as we go along. Um, when we get out to 2024, um, there's a significant deficit. I, um, I was curious. I mean, I know it's not a lot of money, but you show the new growth going down. And right. it's, you know, that's. I mean, when I'm you sure. make these projections, you're obviously trying to forecast. And um, we've been riding away for quite a while. And. Um, you know, the economy is not going to be like this forever. And I, if we don't have a recession within two years, I'll be shocked. And I'm so just, positive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying it's been, it's been, it's been so long, and it, it's going to hit sooner or later. So that, that is that, what that projection is. Yeah, it's not a lot of money. I'm just yeah. a couple hundred thousand, but we're still. And for local aid, you kept it flat. What is the average, though? Um, the local aid uh, over the years, like this year, this year was good. We netted about two hundred and twenty thousand in local aid, but that the previous year in uh, nineteen, from eight uh, from eighteen to nineteen, the net we we went down seventy four thousand dollars. So it. 
I mean, yeah. so it, it, it fluctuates, but I can give you the average on that. Does the state think we're now at our ability to pay rate? You know how we for years we were getting less and less as mm -hmm. we could afford to pay more. Are we like finally down at the well, as Joe was saying, from the things that they've been passing at, at the state level, it doesn't help Norton a lot because they consider us a community that can afford to pay. Mike, how is the um, the impact of Blue Star, the new Blue Star Industrial Park, contemplated in these numbers? Um, Blue Star is contemplated um, as new growth, hopefully next fiscal year. There's there's um, because we don't get the new growth until obviously the buildings are up. Um, they've got to get all their infrastructure in. Right. And um, they are going to start buildings this spring, but I don't think they'll be done in, in time uh, to come to us this next fiscal year. But okay. hopefully, hopefully they can speed it up. Um, so, the, like this year, we, we're doing well because they pulled two permits okay. for buildings already. And uh, Chris has left, but Chris did a good job with El Milo. Um, when they were looking for their occupancy, he had them do a new evaluation and audit of every, the value of everything that they did in that building. And with that, they had to pay another $400,000 uh, to the town as part of their permit. So went up to 1.9 now. So. So this five hundred thousand dollar number for new growth in fiscal year twenty twenty two, that's just kind of a ballpark <coughs> estimate that right. does include the assessors had actually told me four hundred thousand, but uh, I was figuring with the new blue star project okay. coming that maybe we'll get get better than that. I just keep hoping that we're underestimating. Right. <laughs> right. I like to be optimistic. So I have to go through with Joe on some of the school choice and charter and see if we can make some estimates on what will happen with those. But right now, it's just a start on that. If I can just read the, the numbers here for folks in the audience or uh, watching TV. Uh, based on your estimates of 3% growth up to 2024, it's projecting a $3.8 million budget shortfall. Correct? Correct. So it seems to me a pretty substantial hurdle to try to understand and get over. So thank you very much for putting this together. I think this is something that a lot of us have wanted to see for a while. And it, it reinforces the, the commonly held belief that we were going to tip into deficit territory pretty soon. And that's with $600,000 of free cash being put to balance the budget, which as Tom DeLuca always says, it's not really cash, it's not really free. <laughs> it's a fact. <laughs> See, we do listen. <laughs> as, as, uh, we need a 3D machine that can print money. <laughs> I have the 3D The middle school has one. We're working on it. Oh, do you? But <laughs> well, we don't have the money. Oh, you don't have the money. Or maybe a time it's changed to goal. Back in time to see what the budgets look like way back when. <laughs> Like 1711, Peter. What? Back in 1711, what our budget was. Is there a document you have with the assumptions made on each one of these here? So, James, point above, two star, estimate with such and such number in such a year. Um, some of these others that are flat and the reasons why. I mean, obviously, you made some conservative assumptions. Do you have a document that outlines those so we can keep? Um, mostly, it's looking at what our new growth was as an average over the last five years, and then trying to figure out well, where is the economy going to be, and um, you know, are the trends going to continue or not continue. So I, that's really how it would be. Maybe right. if there's anything that would help, yeah, we can look at it historically okay. and, and know what's putting these numbers. You know, I look at one of the shocks I just got with my water bill and the projections are going up. January 1, and again in July 1, it's not an easy hit to take, you know, is there an impact for that kind of information in here? <coughs> so, yeah, so I guess my question is, at what point do we raise the red flag and say that there's a real problem and we need to 
to start having conversations about how to address this. I know I highlighted fiscal year 24, but in fiscal year 21, there's a $1.3 million shortfall. In 22, it's one point nine, and in 23, it's 2 million. So this is, this is not a problem that's four years away. This is on our doorstep. And I realize that we're making conservative estimates. It's much better to be conservative and over-deliver than the other way around. Um, but for me, this is deeply concerning. I don't think any department in town is flush with cash. And we need to find a way to balance a $1.4, $1.3 million shortfall next year. I don't know how we're going to do that. As far as raising the red flag, Jack, we've been having that conversation for years. Yep. You think we've you'll notice that $600,000 of free cash is in there? Mm -hmm. If it doesn't come in, you're sure. short an extra six hundred. Yeah, that's that's right. we should be even discuss not putting action. it in the budget at all. That's just right. to, to exactly. reveal the reality of our situation. Exactly. Six hundred thousand is artificial. It might not be there next year or the year after. But you know, we've discussed: do we not even put it in? And you know, you know tough love. I mean, it would have, it would have had very negative impacts on a lot of departments. But. You know, it's just discussions, but you know, it's just it, this is a reality. But you spend six hundred thousand a year. So where do we go from here with this glimpse of the future? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, with, with what you said, if you're showing a deficit, you can't possibly have the six hundred. Mm -hmm. So starting next year, you're not at one point three or at two. Right. So we're just going to continue to ignore the problem, I guess. <laughs> you know, I'm I, what, so what is, I mean, seriously, what is a solution, though? I mean, we've been down this road before. We are trying to tell people, townspeople, how serious this is. And... It just is, oh no, they have the money, they'll find the money. I mean, what, when does it get to a point where people actually start, I mean, we're in a room with all of us, and I think everybody is like, well, 3.8 in a few years, deficit. Yeah, I mean, I don't get it. <clears throat> so I think it, that's exactly the point, is that there, there needs to be some sort, of, some sort of education going out to, to share this with people. Well, obviously the only solution is to increase revenue. Right? And that's the only solution. Mm -hmm. And everyone knows what that, that means. So How is that the only well, solution? They're, they're I mean, are you talking override? Yeah. I didn't know if you were talking override or new business. So I just well, well, it's all, well, all, all, all new business. business. Right? All business. hope for new business. Right. That'd be preferable, but we, you know, we've been hoping for that for a long time. Well, you know, we've, we've been, you know, saying, well, you know, we're not going to do an override. We're going to solve this with new business. And we do our best to bring it in. We do our best to make that happen. But there's only so long we can just sit back and wait for it to happen. So I guess that's the conversation to have is do we really think that we can solve this with new business? Or, we, you know, do we keep just kind of hanging on and hoping? I think um, we also have to talk about the elephant in the room, too, is there, there is people are trying to bring new business, but it's very difficult to get through some of our boards to actually start their business that that's that's an issue that's an issue that needs to be addressed probably sooner rather than later uh, you know it's nobody wants to talk about it but it is it's a problem <coughs> they, they try to bring new business in and they get they get you know fight after fight of, of what they need to do I mean it's I have friends that it's happened to and they give up they go to Mansfield I mean Sherry I don't think that's the only problem either like you know we've talked to people too who said it's it's expensive to come here like the tie-ins are expensive so like how do we as a community say like where you know we have this an opportunity to tips when we have opportunities to to give reduced you know fees if we're going to attract certain businesses here you know the other thing is the infrastructure i mean we don't you know i, I know i think you mentioned or did you ask a question about the uh you did the capital with the, the, the patents right, right yeah um, I mean, that's a huge thing, too. So the other thing that's coming, you know, from the EIDC is, well, yeah, we want to come here, but you don't have the infrastructure. Like, I, I don't want to spend $2.5 million on putting um, septic in. I want to tie in, but we don't have that ability. So how do we, you know, and, and, and I, I know the Water and Sewer Commission isn't here, but, like, how do we work with them to also look at that and, and be part of that, that plan? I, I think it's part of the master plan, too, so maybe some of those things will flush out 
but it's it's not just because of the boards that people aren't coming here. Oh, ag agree. I think that's certainly a part of it, but yeah. there's a lot of pieces of this, and I think the overwhelming part of this is we've all had these conversations, but what is a solution, and who do we look to to, to make this happen? I don't know the answer to that. I, I think, as Renee was saying, uh, the planning board will be working on the master plan and looking for input from everybody, and we have to get the Water and Sewer Commission fully involved in that so that the logic isn't that we'll wait for a developer to come to put in that sewer line. No, let's look at, we. this is an area we, we feel it's important to develop in the town. If we put the infrastructure in, then we can attract businesses to come in because they know the sewer will be there rather than have them have to pay for it. Which then just adds to the reality that it's <laughs> here. More money. And do we do we have a water and sewer commission that are um, agreeable to that? Well, that will have to be part of the process with the master plan to bring them on board on that. So it hasn't been a discussion at this point. We can talk about it next week, right? They're coming for our next February, so February meeting. So, so I think it, it's kind of. Um, I think the conversation is great and you know I, I only have a certain responsibility but it's a responsibility that's the biggest chunk of the budget so if you have a piece of pie I like pie if you have a piece of pie your pie is right now according to these projections gone it, it, it's it's a little piece of the pie and you need a bigger pie right so that's part one I find it interesting not only for the schools but for the town if we're going to have questions about the building, which we are, looking for potential debt exclusions for Town Hall, the Senior Center, and maybe Athletic Complex, if that comes to fruition, whatever the final decision is that the folks in the room will make, what this projection is telling you is yet you're not going to have bodies in those buildings. That's right. 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 You just did it with the fire department. We opened it, we closed it. No arrows being thrown at anybody here. That's just a fact. So if we look at this, my concern is some of you have been critical of the window project. You know, getting a new window. What happens if we have to close the school? Within the 20 years, 20 years of the MSBA project, you get to pay it back. It's no different. And you know, we're talking about police, uh, excuse me, fire department, uh, excuse me, town hall and uh, community center, senior center. It's wonderful to have that. But what your projected numbers here are saying is you're not going to have the bodies. And by we, I mean including the schools. I'm not differentiating the schools in this discussion. We, the town, are not going to have the funding to put bodies in the positions that you need it. You can run as much volunteerism you want, but eventually you run out. <coughs> or you don't get what you really need. So um, it goes back to the comment I made in 2015. Who do you want to be, Norton? Who do you want to be? It's really simple. Um, we see it on the school side with socioeconomics. Um, we see it with free and reduced lunch. We see it with providing services. And I know that doesn't hit home for some of you because you haven't been involved with the schools for a long time or you never were involved with the schools in terms of your children. But those are facts. So I just worry about when I see this number, and I, I'm very thankful because you know James has, has been very thorough with us in our meetings talking about you know, free cash is going to go down eventually in the next few years. It just is. Um, you know, maybe we can get some luck uh, on the other side of town uh, where the building's going on and some more uh, uh, stuff that just came in, some more funds that just came in. But, I, I mean, I sit here and I just say, you know, the elephant in the room. We all know what the elephant in the room is. And I mean, the school department's consistently blamed for it um, in terms of an override. But stop blaming. Just fix it. Fix the problem. And the problem is you're not going to be able to, to service the very people that you want to surface with brand new buildings or brand new programming in the school department or whatever it may be. And that's, Why that's. Keep looking at me, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm looking at you because I think at times, and we disagree, as we, you know, but I, I think at we, times we, this is this is where the boy, this we is. We disagree to disagree, but we don't disagree on the fact that we need money. Right, exactly. <laughs> and the fact is we could disagree on what the priorities Absolutely. of that money is, but, but at the end of the day, you know, if if you, when, I say this, and, and I said this to, to Mike a while back when we were meeting, we built a new high school with a 39,000 square foot extension, never budgeting for the cleaning of 39,000 <laughs> square feet of a building. Right. 
So we had to hire another three-quarter custodian my first year that I was here. You know, it, so that you could try to say to the taxpayers, hey, thank you for the money, thank you for supporting. Now I'm trying, and I don't know if you've looked at our schools, but our schools are in pretty good shape. We're spending, trying to spend our money in it. Um, that's what I'm saying. There's an operational cost here that that these numbers are saying are, are going to really be a problem. And it has an impact on all of us. Sorry. I think the first step in fixing a problem is admitting that there is a problem. Based on the <laughs> this is an intervention. <laughs> like, this, this is a problem. It's unfortunate. The people in this room have known about the problem and have been talking about the problem for years, but there are other people, there's a, a majority of people don't want to hear the problem. And they, they'd rather be like an ostrich and stick their head in the sand and think it's going to go away. That we're lying because we have some ulterior motive. But I mean, anybody who looks at the books and deals, all you gotta do is spend one year, you know, working for the town. And you know how desperate people are and what, what great employees we have who they go over and above. And it's only because of people like that that we get things done because they do more than we're really paying them to do. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have a majority of the townspeople in this room to vote to fund things properly. So it's, it's trying to get, I, I don't know, if I knew the answer, I, I, I'd be king of North. <laughs> but it just, people just don't, want, they don't want to be told that we need more money and it's, it's going to have some sort of override. They just, they think, I think, fortunately in the past, we've been able to bite the bullet and pull, pull a golden ring out or something. I mean, back, back a long time ago, when I was younger, um, we were basically in almost the same situation. Back, I think, around 92, isn't that where? 93. 91. 91. <laughs> I, when uh, they changed the formulas and the property to that changed, and all of a sudden, not got this windfall because they changed the, uh, the equations on how to fund education and things like that. And so it, it, it took, took away that burden that we should have taken care of 30 years ago. Well, now it's, now it's finally catching up with us. And fortunately or unfortunately, Norton has become a more affluent town, and we don't qualify for some of the extra funds the state is giving in. And I mean, it's good for Norton, but it's bad for our budget. And and until we find a way to convince the majority of the people that we're not we're not out for this money for ourselves, we get we get no enjoyment, we get no we get nothing out of getting extra tax money, other than the fact that we're doing it not to service ourselves, but to service the town, and to give all the residents of this town the services they deserve, and. I don't, I don't know the answer. I guess, I guess that's why after all the years, we know you didn't have to give it up. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's unfortunate that, that people who speak loudest against the money are the ones that they don't get, most of them don't get involved and don't know the answers and don't really see things firsthand. But it's uh, the, the uh, gossip and the half truths that go around, and the way that people put a spin on something that just, you know, it's a 1% truth and 90% fiction. And it's amazing how that, that story will fly. And they can, they can debate you and explain exactly why we don't need the money and exactly how we're, we're spending it on. We have a secret rocket ship to take us to, to Mars 
and Dr. Baird has got it stuck over the high school someplace. I don't know if I'm But we, we, we need, actually, we need better public, public relations, I guess. We have to explain to the townspeople that this is serious. We're, we're not out to get this money for ourselves. We're out to get this for all the people. Because all the people in North deserve, you know, a decent facility. They deserve a town hall they can walk into without tripping over ramps or, or free, freezing or have ceiling tiles fall on the heads. They, the seniors deserve a place to go to where they can actually have decent restrooms. They can actually have functions that they, their schedule is so tight and their attendance is so limited that the number of people who want to go and utilize things can't because of the lack of space. It's, it's just, it's very disheartening to put so much time into trying to help the community just to have so many people who don't get involved know all the answers and can tell you exactly why everything you think is correct. So, so how do we reach out to the town? You just said public relations. How do we reach out to the town with a neutral, not special interest type groups putting their own product out? As a town, this is what we do. This is what we have. How do we show the people that are disputing these numbers what is happening? I think that's what we're all looking for right, right. now. And we need to do that. And all I said, we, we just have to put together, uh, I mean, it's going to be somebody who's much better at sales than I am. But we just have to, we have to show them the, the true figures, the true facts. People have to, and it has to be in a unif unified voice. We can't have the board of selectmen hopping about something about the school. The school committee can't be against something that, I don't know, I'll just, we'll, we'll just say the board of selectmen because we're here. But everybody has to work as one team. Otherwise, we're, we're all going to just. You just, so you just said a mouthful right there because yeah. one team, unified voice. No more special group, this group. One says one thing, and then the next thing you find out is some chipping away at the foundation. Yeah. I think we're a unified group, and that's the way we have to work as a team, as a department, as a as a town to disseminate the information we want. This this does this is beautiful, but unless we can explain it to everybody that's in this room so they can understand it, right. they're not going to feel a 3.8 number when it's just as on a piece of paper. But we need to quantify that number, right? And we're not yeah. going to quantify it by the best police department, the safest in the town, the great schools and the great teachers that we have, the great fire department. We need to say, look, when we hit this 3.8 or half of the fire department, your response time is going to be much more than it would be, right? Or half the police department or half the schools. Like, we need to say, what's the impact of this number to the town? So, from, from my perspective in, in a financial sense, I see this, make it simple. This is a house. My house needs a roof, windows, doors, and a furnace. That's what all these negative, these negatives represent one of those items. Which one am I gonna hit first? I think we need to, we need to be able to present here are our problems, here are our priorities, this is how we're going to solve it. And, and we can't, from, from the naysayers I've talked to, you can't say, well, you have a negative, you, you have a budget deficit and want a new town hall. Which is it? So we collectively need to figure out what our priorities are, and then we have to go at them one at a time. It's the only way. I think that's do. what ad hoc was. I mean, you know, we created the ad hoc hoping to do just that. And now, you know, kind of taking a step back because, you know, Steve and, and Brad, what you guys talked about, that we all need to be on the same page. That's exactly the reason 
why we started having these joint meetings mm -hmm. with all of us because each board was on their own path you know we each had our own thoughts I mean we we killed ourselves trying to get information out about those last two overrides and we had people in this room who got different opinions and didn't feel the same way so how is how is the leaders that people have put into these positions how can we be saying we need this when us as a group don't agree with that and so I think a big part of it is having all of us sit down and, and discuss these things and figure out how do we get ourselves out of this. Because for so long, Norton hasn't done anything about the issues that we are faced with. We just we just keep moving along and, and people are like, no, they're fine. So I think I think a big part of it is is us sitting in this room and having conversations like this. And, and now that we're doing this, I'm thinking, do we really need ad hoc or should it be this? This you know, probably give this a Exactly. I, I don't. This is much. Better. I'm sorry, sorry. No, go ahead. Like being my age, time's getting late. I might fall asleep. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> you got ten minutes till bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> I told him I wouldn't let him fall out of his no. chair. <laughs> there you go. Yep. I, I hear what everybody's saying. You know, we said let's try to get the point across to the people. Okay. It's it's not that they don't believe the numbers. Okay. It's that we've been able to turn the lights on every year without it. They come in. They see the lights are on at town hall school buildings on, the buses come back, pick the kids up, drop them off, everybody's happy. Not, they're not really happy, but they don't see the impact. Back several years ago, and I'll get to guarantee you people will know the date, we closed the police station and we closed the North School. Yes. Okay. Next station is 1991. There you go. And the North School, 1993. Okay. And it didn't, nobody got excited. When you dialed 911, you got Attleboro. Somebody said, why? We should be building. We closed the fire station. When I moved into town, we had five fire stations. We got one. That didn't seem to excite people. I don't know what it takes to excite people except that they just don't want to spend any more money. We just got a water bill. I mean, my rate's going to go up six bucks, right, every quarter. You would think that they were just imposing a $1,000 a month fee on it. That's how bad it is. People don't want to spend any more money. Do they recognize that we really are running they won't recognize it until we shut all the lights off. But the problem okay. is, do we, do we as the leaders really <clears throat> want to get to that point <clears throat> where we've made some positive momentum? We want, so, so we want to bring it to them so they understand it's, this is what it's going to cost you because if you don't spend this money, this is what you're not going to have tomorrow. But I feel like we've done that. We, we've done that exercise and people still just either yeah, don't we, care, don't get it. But Sherry, we've done it, but we didn't do it. Right. We've done the exercise, but we never did what we said we were going to do if we didn't get it. I think the frustrating part of that is because sitting on school committee is because I don't want to, I'm tired of feeling like we live in a poor town. We are not a poor town. Right, so why, why, why are we going to harm our students, you know, and, and bring them to basics, the people at town hall, why are we going to do that just to show the townspeople, oh, maybe now you'll listen to us. No, that's I not what I was saying. What I was saying yeah. is, as long as we continue to float along the way we are, nothing's going to change because nobody is impacted. But what's the alternative? The alternative is we've got to do what nobody wants to do and take our chances. We have to push. And if we go united and not say, oh, yeah, it's all because the school wants another 10% or because this one wants it, if we don't do it, if we do it that way, we might as well forget it, okay, because you're going to, you know, when the overrides went down, okay, yeah. they were, everybody said, oh, it's all the seniors. We don't have that many seniors to have defeated that override. It was people who have children in the school system, okay? They had no benefit. <coughs> what is the, be the benefit of the last override didn't mean that you weren't going to reduce bus rates, kids are still going to have to pay to get on the bus. So the parents look at it and say, wait a minute, I'm going to vote for an override, but I'm not going to get a decrease in the bus fees. I'm still going to have to pay it. It's actually free busing, but yeah. Well, free busing back when my kids went to school, I would have been, I would have been nuts yeah. if I had to pay to put my kid on the bus. <laughs> well, last override was for free busing. But yeah. yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. Okay. I don't know what the solution is. What's, what's Mary had one on Remember, it's if I can even abuse. remember what I want to say at this point, um, Sherry. Okay, so I feel your frustration because we've been through. Yeah, uh, a lot of people in this room have been through overrides, but you and I have been pretty close on a, on a few of them. Um, honestly, I think we're wrong to blame ourselves for the overrides not passing. I think the leadership in this town has gotten out there. We've said the message. People are not hearing us. I don't know why they're not hearing us, but it's not because of lack of effort on our part. 
I think the conversation tonight has been great. I think we always talk about priorities, et cetera. Yes, we do need the town hall. Yes, we do need a senior center. Yes, we could use some new fields. But you know what, you guys, what we have to say tonight is those aren't the priorities. The priorities are our budget that we can't afford right now. So why would we, even as a group, and I'm not taking anything away from the building committee because we've charged them to do that, but now that this conversation has come to light and we're all talking about it, why are we going to ask a town to fund the debt exclusion of $20 million and we only need $2 million and an override to get our basics, like to, our, to put the food on the table, right? We need to take care of our, <coughs> what gets us through life, right? Not not the fancy stuff. The fancy stuff will come. We've got to get the town to listen to us on a, on a $2 million override. Why do we think we can get $20 million debt exclusion passed in this town when we can't? For 15 years, we have not been able to get $1.5 million, $2 million. And we were telling people, we're taking this away from your seniors, we're taking this away from your students. Until the public in this town believes what the leaders are saying, we either have, we're really sucky leaders, right? Mm -hmm. But honestly, I don't think that's true. I think they're just not believing us because of what Tom said in part, the lights come on at the end of the day. The kids get on the bus. People find the way to pay the 350. I'm paying 350 for my daughter to pay, play middle school basketball. Are you kidding me? You do love that 350. And I have to take time out of work to go watch her. Like, really. But no, but you know, I'm aside. We, we really, we as leaders have to say, okay guys, we, every single one of us has said it when we run for election or asked to be uh, appointed to a board. We need to prioritize. We need to work together. We work together. Now we need to show the town that we can prioritize. And I'm sorry, I don't think the building's our priority right now. I think this is what our priority should be. And somehow we need to figure out how we're gonna get that out there. And it can't be just two members of the Board of Selectmen, two members of FinCom, and two members of the school committee doing it. It has to be an all-out blitz. As bad as the people want the, the senior center or the town hall or the fields, we've gotta get people that excited about just paying our freaking bills. And it can't be a debt exclusion. No. no, 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 not, not a dedicated exclusion. Dedicated. No. no, no, no. Okay. Well, maybe if we take the buildings and things off the board and say, we can't That's even consider we tonight and in to say, our, collectively, we're not going to support any future debt exclusions for buildings until we come up with a way as a town to support the infrastructure that we already have. And, and that actually is the consequences that we've been trying to, like talked of the lights come on, there's no real visible, um, you know, um, proof of what we're saying because if we're not gonna get this money, you know, this is gonna happen, but the lights come on, the, the police respond, the fire respond. This, you know, if, if that's taken off the table, it's finally, you know, proof of what we've been saying all along, that we can't afford it. We can't, you know, the operating budget, is, is, you know, is the priority. I guarantee if we put a debt exclusion, sorry, jumping in, but I have a minute, so I'm taking it. If we put a debt exclusion out there tomorrow, we would hear the seniors can't afford it, uh, the single parent can't, we would hear all these reasons why we can't afford the debt exclusion. But, but nobody had a $2 million, I'm sorry, a $2 million override, but nobody's got a problem with a $20 million debt exclusion. That's a heck of a lot more money. And a debt exclusion isn't just for five years, it's 20 years out, and we're already paying on a debt exclusion. But Mary, for right me, now. it's a permanent. It's not but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. No. <laughs> but, but, I'm it's, saying, it, it, in, I was going to say, to, to your point, Mary, most people, um, in Bill's analogy, it, to save money long term, you have to spend money short term. Maintenance, so forth, you know what I'm saying? But people can, people can vision a building. People can vision an athletic complex. They, this is numbers. And 10% really I focus, as I can see, I, I use this, I use this, I use that. Some people don't use the senior center. So it's, 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 they just look at it from a visual perspective a lot. You know, I agree. I think you do have to definitely, you know, spend money um, to make this budget work for all. But I think people just, the debt exclusion, they look at a number, it's finite. Okay, yeah, 
Yeah, that, that uh, it's going to be for 20 years, and then it's, it goes down each year with floats and so forth, so they can, can wrap their head around that. But um, no, I agree. I think um, that there are needs, and we have to prioritize those needs, and we have to should as a group here come up with a, a top three um, the things that we can all agree on um, and take that message out. So, I, I think that one of the things that we've struggled with in the past, and out of a, uh, an abundance of, of trying to be transparent and uh, show the community what we're going to use the money for, we've had all these slate of projects that we were going to use it for, whether it be for the schools, for the seniors, for the police, for the fire. And then we'd get these little factions of people that would nitpick one little portion of it. But you got a bunch of groups that are nitpicking in. So we had a lot of people that didn't support it that would have supported it overall, but they didn't like this component. Mm -hmm. So I think that we've got to be careful as to how we package it um, if we decide to move forward. And you know, right now, because taking the free cash out, we've got a two million dollar uh, shortfall right. this fiscal year coming up. Yes, um, that's a big number, and it just gets worse as we go. So, you know, I think if we if we're looking at doing something like this, I would recommend that we pick a number, knowing that next year seventy percent is going to go to the schools, thirty percent is going to go to the town, and what they do with it at that point is what they do with it but not give a, a, a litany of projects or uh, initiatives that are going to be a result of it. Because if we give, if we say, well, $2 million of this is going to be for the schools, that's $1.4 million in the next fiscal year. Where's that 600000 going to come from? So we've got to make sure that we're less, I think, less, more focused on, on the need and more focused on uh, the number as opposed to what that number is going to do. We can all have our independent conversations, but uh, right now we're two million dollars short, regardless of that, that, as it is today. Thank you. So I could say, like, I, I think of it as the average person sits there and you say you need an override, we need no more, more money for the town. They will, and you say, well, we're going to cut fire, we're going to cut police, you know. They will to save money, to not spend, not have the taxes raised. They will take that chance. They'll say to themselves, the majority of people in Norton probably don't have any interaction with the police other than to see them pull someone over or see them once in a while. They don't, they don't think they use them. Same with the fire. And it's the majority yet, the majority of people are saying, I don't want police out of the fire. I don't want my raise my taxes. That's what they're thinking. They don't want to raise taxes. That's what the two and a half override is, and they don't want it. That's what I think, regardless until you, like you said, start turning off the lights until they are affected. It's not tangible. It's not tangible. So but can I just say, so that's, that, that in my head, we've done, we've, we've done that where we've said, you know what, if, if this doesn't, and I understand that we didn't always follow through because for us as a school committee, we didn't want to, we didn't want to hurt our students. So we right. made choices, we used school Started choice fees. money, whatever it is, yep. we yep. upped our fees, whatever it is. We so we've done, <coughs> right, exactly, I mean, you've had no, I mean, I so ran Park and Rec for eight and a half years. Absolutely. I totally get it. So we've done this before. So here's, and maybe this is my night, I'm being naive, right? We've got a senior center, a town hall, athletic complex. Something that everybody in this town would, would want, something of, right? So in my head, I'm thinking, let's put them together. Let's go forward with the debt exclusion for these three projects. Let's get it passed, hopefully. And we start to show our town what happens when you actually work together, right? Then you start to build on the positive momentum. Now, I didn't have this information in front of me about how serious, you know, our, our we were going to be. Um, but in my naive mind, I'm thinking we've already done the we're going to shut this down, we're going to do this. So in my mind, I'm thinking let's pull together, let's pass something where everybody gets something, and then start the moment, the positive momentum in this town by thinking, you know what, we can get more if we work together. Maybe it's stupid, but I, I've already been on three override attempts committees, and every time they failed. And we've, we've done this dance. So I thought, let's think outside the box and do something different. Does it work? I don't know. But we've got to try something for people to understand where we're at. I don't know the answer. Then you have to look at everything. I mean, you could look at, I'm just throwing out numbers. You do an override for three million, but a million of that goes to pay capital projects every year. So as Tom said, a debt exclusion for 25 million is going to be for the rest of his life. Well, if you did, 
if you did a three million, I'm just throwing it. If you did a three million dollar override, and one million of that goes to pay capital debt every year, you have the money to pay the notes for the town yeah. hall, the yeah. senior yeah. center, the call for the year. Because I think at this at this process, if we pull back on a town hall, senior center, and athletic complex, I, <laughs> this town's going to go ballistic. Good. But, but I, I mean, you think they're going to pull for an? They're going to say, okay, we're going to need three million for an override. They're going to say no. If we say though that there has to be a priority, a priority, that have, priorities have to be made. And if we're in the hole this much, how can we put together something like that? I understand your point of view of let's get them going and let's see what happens after that. But what ha happens after that if they still vote no? Yeah, we but we, we so we continue year after year with voting no. And keep banging your head against a wall and doing the same thing, you know, over and over again. But if we do get the debt exclusion passed, and then that puts us even further into the hole from operating expenses, then what? Yeah, I don't know. But I'd rather say we need two million bucks just to keep the crappy town hall and senior center we need open. I'd love to have the other things, but we can't even keep the ones that we've got open. Yeah, I, Mike, I, I, I see that. I see that point, but there's still a value to reinvesting in the community. I mean, we can't just say we're going to stop everything yeah, because you know what's going to happen. Group. People are going to come in. You no, know, people who, who yeah. like potential residents, right? They're going to come in and say, wait, what? You haven't passed an override. Your schools are cutting what? You're, you're, I'm walking in your town hall and it looks like this, right? Like, <laughs> we still, again, it's back to priority. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that we, we solve it completely. And I'm with you. When we build these things, right, we're going to be paying more money. So we have to figure out, um, you know, go, like, do we have land that we can sell? Like, can we, can we, is there something that we can do that we haven't done before? Um, and I'll talk a bit about that later, that we, we have an opportunity to increase the tax base or, or get some revenue. That, that's but, but I don't think we can completely just shut it down and say, we can't look at ways to improve our town. I, I don't think we can just turn a blind eye to that. And, and I understand it, and I would love to do it, and, and if I thought it would have the impact that we all would want, and it would be great, but you know what we're going to do? We're going to score ourselves, right? Because we're involved, we want these things, and now we're going to cut it out, and the people who don't care, they, they're just not going to care. I think that's one of the steps, too, is to review what do we have for town properties? We hate to say, but we have a cemetery on the other side of town. It looks beautiful, but if it comes down to a revenue producing number, it's something to be done. One, one question we had last year we were talking about levying our tax base. I thought I remember from our conversation the assessors were saying that we're not levying 100% of the actual, they had some work to do on on the actual assessment of valuations. Has that been rectified? But I think, we don't have to answer that now, but I think some of those discussions we dig into a little deeper and find out is there other ways? And then satisfy all of those and then figure it out. But at least ask the questions, look at the process, what do we have? You know, debt exclusions are, they start at a cost. You usually go one or two years up and then 18 years down. As I'm reminded by a good friend, overrides are forever. That's the difference, folks. That's the difference. And so the fact of the matter is, um, it's not, it's, it's, it's convictions of, of um, where, you, where you decide to go next is, you know, the, the biggest problem I always see with this stuff is that Mike and I practically have to be silent on override votes because of the law. All we can do is provide you the facts of why we asked for two million on our side and Mike asked for a million. That's all we can do. We can't hold signs. We can't lick envelopes. We can't tell people to vote yes. We can just say, hear that. You folks can, to a certain extent. Um, so it, it's... It's really tough to to um, to listen um, to not wanting to do the right thing for the town because our budget's already <coughs> potentially two million dollars in, in the hole without even knowing what Mike and I were talking about earlier, not knowing what our health care costs are and all of that. Um, I think it was a FinCon member last year who said, "Let's zero out, let's zero out, let's zero out uh, the uh, free cash." Don't use the 600. Don't use it. <coughs> now you're 2.6 in the hole. Is that enough? I always say that. I know you do. I just didn't want to quote you because I already <laughs> did that once earlier. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 
<laughs> yep. You're buying the coffee tomorrow morning. <laughs> right. um, but but if you if it, it, it you're at that point where you know that the the discussion is I mean you're you're I have a I have a, a, a part of my budget that the only way it survives is if I take away from the other part of the budget. The mandated budget has to be done by law or open you open us up for lawsuits, which I don't want to do. I, it, it would be immoral of me to do. Quite simple. So then, it's look at all those other line items. Tom mentioned earlier, you know, God forbid if he had to pay for transportation when his kids went to school. Um, general ed is going to pay for special ed. I hate to say it out loud that way because it's wrong to say it that way, but that's what's going to happen if I'm, if I'm cutting. It's just that simple. Um, and I don't know how much more you're going to cut on the town side because I have friends that are builders that don't know when the office is, is open. So they don't do business in this town. It's that simple. You've heard that tonight from somebody else. Uh, it's true. It's a factual piece of information because you're working with people that are part-time and so on and so forth. And that's not their work ethic. It's just because you only said you're only working 15 hours a week. Um, and to sit here after all this time of listening to building committee and their work and say there's a potential to discuss we may have to yet put another hole. Just remember, all of us put money into our homes so that 10 years from now it's worth a little bit more, right? You spend 10,000 on the roof so you can have it for 20 more years and if you, it's an investment that you make. I, I think it's, I know it's hard to say this out loud, but man, there's no community that needs to invest in its infrastructure more than this does. And there's only one or two communities in the state that have ever gone out for a debt exclusion and an override at the same time. One was successful over by us um, when we were in Holbrook, Rockland, literally back-to-back -back years. Um, I don't know if that's in play, but the fact of the matter is if you don't have, if your buildings, if you don't build something, you're going to see a 7.5 to 10.5% minimum. I'm, I'm actually on a permanent building committee in my hometown, believe it or not, of public safety. They've, they've gone out for two and a half years if we don't build it now. And we're looking at a 14% increase over three years if we don't go out for a question this spring. Just in labor and material costs. We're going from $729 a square foot to almost $1,000 a square foot during that time. That's crazy. Um, and, and, they're not, and it's a debt exclusion question. <coughs> you know. So I guess one of my questions that I would ask is, what is our capacity to borrow on any project such as the ones that we're talking about? You know, and I don't know that number, and Mike, I'm, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, so uh, I don't expect a, a response. But what is our capacity to borrow? The school department's potential borrowing right now is the window project, um, which has already been passed and is going to be somewhere in that <coughs> 350 to 450 range per year. Um, I don't really see, except the potential of, uh, we're not putting in for an SOI with an MS MSBA project right now. We do have the RFQ, which was on an agenda, which I think we just should put off to another meeting, um, <laughs> with all due respect. That is an opportunity for us to look at all of our buildings and take a look at a more proactive approach that could then also support the envelope study and everything else the building committee is already doing. But if we have a capacity to borrow, can we take that a percentage of that capacity to borrow and take it off the top? Of a, of a potential three-part debt exclusion, two-part, one-part, whatever you decide you, you're going to do, the tough decision you're going to have to make down the road about these projects. Do we have the capacity to, to borrow some more, include that as part of, a debt ex uh, part of an override vote? In other words, you know that you're borrowing and you're going to have to pay half a million every single year. Include that as, a, as part of your, of your override vote. So if you're looking for two million, you're actually saying it's 2.5 because we're adding that a potential to borrow on the long-term debt exclusion for the building. Because if you don't do the buildings now, and I know I'm probably speaking to at least one of my members who's saying, I think what I was saying, you, you're, you're gonna actually show the community that, the, that we are out to lunch as leaders because we're just putting this off yet again. And so, and I understand. And we can't afford our day-to-day -day living. How do we say this is going to bigger house? I, I agree. I agree with you. But the but the house is falling down. That's the problem. The only, I mean, that that's the issue. It, and when the house is falling down, it's going to get even worse. So, so when so your house falls down, who comes in and saves it? 
your personal is no. You either fix right. it or you don't. Right. This is what we have to say to the public. This is a problem that's been going on for years. But do we actually, as a group, think that they're going to approve a $20 million debt exclusion and a $2 million grant? And where's our priority? I get, I get the new buildings. I get that we bring the town together. I, I love the idea. But sitting here and looking at these numbers tonight, somehow we as leaders have to come up with a plan. And maybe, Joe, what you just said is right. Maybe it is, you can add on more to the borrowing, but this is going to be a tough sell to the public. Mary, does, what, does your concern there lead us right back to Mr. Unit's uh, suggestion of, or, uh, of a $3 million override where a million of it is set to pay for? Or, so you're putting a single item bef before, um, and this override is going to solve your operational budget. It's going to give us the cat, the, you know, the what are capital projects, the, the senior center, the town hall, school, uh, you know, fields for the schools, um, and it's just there's a million dollars in the budget now to pay those bills. Um, does that does that does his? I mean, it's an interesting. Uh, I like it. It's an interesting way to kind of fold it all into one presentation, one neatly wrapped box with a bow on it um, to put before the townspeople because I do think that there is, you know, uh, if, if that's part of it, there is a coalition of people in this town who are all going to get something out of that. On the operational side, on the school side, from the seniors, and um, past overrides, one thing I do not remember is the chairman of the finance committee, the chairman of the board of selectmen, as it was at the time, uh, and the chairman of the school committee standing side by side, unified as to here is exactly what needs to happen and what we all agree on. We need you to get on board with us. I don't remember that ever happening. And that would make a massive difference because when you, when you argue against it, when you're in a conversation with someone and you're debating, should we do this, should we not? And, they, and someone is saying, no, we should not. You should, you, it's very easy to say, well, the chairman of the, the select board, chairman of the school committee, and the chairman of the finance committee all think we should. That's a simple message to get out. I think it's even more powerful if it's this, if it's all of this, because that's never been done. If we can get to that point. It has been done. In 2011, we did it. 2011, we passed the debt exclusion for the high school. I was chairman of the finance committee. Okay, you don't know how many hate calls I got. Right. I, I actually ran that debt, debt exclusion. Right. And Mr. O'Neill was on the building committee, and we used to go back and forth all the time. Well, right. Why do you need this? Why do you need that? But it got built. Right, but I was the okay. chair of Pride that was pushing that yeah. to, out to the community. But you remember that we were all together on it. And as a matter of fact, one of the things, which is probably in the minutes, I said, what I said was, what, not, what kind of a town do we want to be? If not now, <laughs> when? Recorded John F. Kennedy. Well, now, well, now okay. Joe's taking it over for yeah, you. Yeah, he took my, he took my he took, Well, uh, yeah. I'll, give, well I'll, I'll give him copyrights. Tom, Tom <laughs> neither, of us, neither of us is going to be around forever. You have to know. You might last longer than I do. Oh, the way it's but going. seriously, that's what we did. Okay? We all voted for it. The selectmen, the school committee, of course, it was your project. And and the finance committee, and it was it went through overwhelmingly. Right? Overwhelmingly, it wasn't because we were getting 40, 50, 4 cents on a dollar back, but it had to be done, and it was done. <coughs> People didn't mind paying more taxes. Matter of fact, I think we're about eight years into the debt exclusion, so in about 12 more years, it should disappear. Mm -hmm. Whatever that is, All right? We that close? It was a 20 years, right? Some yeah. of the notes are due, I think, uh, 2030, and the rest are 2032. Oh, 2032? Two separate borrowings. Okay. One at the beginning of the project. Well, I'm not going to worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> Which, uh, but that's, that's how it happened. So I don't know if we can get to unanimity in the room, but if you can get to majority on each board and let the um, yeah, well, chairman of each board be a unanimous trio. That's one way to stand forward and present it. And if we're talking about like this, the three million with a million going towards capital projects, I think if we, if it's always going to be capital projects, I think 
we have to indicate that one third of that override forever will be dedicated to the capital projects. After paying for the contracts, that portion of the override will only be used for capital projects in the future. And every year it goes up to an AF percent. Exactly. Where a debt excluded does not. It's great, right? Because right? then we're ready for Charlie when it happens. We're ready for, you know. Maybe this is our way. It goes right up. Every year it goes up to an interest. Okay, well, obviously this has started a great conversation that needs to be continued. Um, I think what we're going to do is we did have some things um, uh, on the... This is the sports copy for every one of the elected officials of so the sports complex. Since we have killed complex. all these trees, please take so one. So I killed the trees already. <laughs> and everything else that was on our agenda, I will share with the Board of Selectmen, Mr. Units, and uh, Phil and the committee, so that you have it electronically. And when it comes up at the next meeting, you'll have it proactively to ask questions. And these meetings are important, so I hope that we do continue the joint meetings. I know they're hard to get everybody together, but... So, so I think, can I just bring up, just because we have ad hoc here, I mean... I think that maybe we should just table ad hoc for right now and maybe <coughs> schedule another joint meeting. And I think that if we meet maybe monthly as a joint meeting, I think we table ad hoc because, again, what's the purpose of two, two, and four? I think that we need to do this. So we, had a, we were supposed to meet next week. Let's cancel that as ad hoc if everyone is, is agrees with that. And let's schedule another joint meeting for next month. Okay. So, motion to adjourn the joint meeting? Oh. Can, can we, can we the uh, item G that's under the joint meeting. I, I'd like to talk about the last item on there. Okay. That's oh, you got the. Uh, <laughs> Uh, presentation on marijuana bylaw and zoning in your packet, similar to the other one. So I won't, I won't take a lot of time on this, um, but I wanted to, to make sure that the, uh, the boards and the committee were aware of a project that the Industrial Development Commission um, is working on right now in conjunction uh, with the planning board and, and certainly are looking for the collaboration of this group. Um, you know, we just talked a lot about money, right? So one of the things that uh, from an IDC perspective that we discussed uh, several months ago, you know, obviously the focus is increasing the tax base, increasing the revenue. Um, how do we do that, right? The, the marijuana industry right now is providing an opportunity that's not going to be there very long. Um, we certainly feel like we're a bit behind on this. Some of the challenges that we have too with some of the other um, companies looking to come in like infrastructure don't exist with the marijuana industry. Um, so if the, I'm not gonna, like I said, I, I won't um, go into detail on all of these, these pages, but I wanted just to provide an overview of the project. So this is something that we're looking to bring in front of town meeting in May. Um, we'll have some info sessions in there as well. What we're doing right now is a, our, our primary focus is, is twofold. One, it's to create a zoning map that people understand that you can visually look at and, and see where um, we would allow marijuana in the town of Norton. And when I say that too, like most people think of retail shops, the, the industry has much more. The industry has uh, distribution, processing, manufacturing, transportation. Um, we've talked to, talked to several potential applicants um, the commission as a whole, um, Mike and Paul DiGiuseppe have also talked to applicants too. So it's certainly, um, people are interested in Norton. We have an opportunity not only to um, leverage the articles that we passed a couple years ago in town meeting, one being a 3% excise tax on the sale of marijuana, but there was also within the host community agreement, a 3% community impact tax. And that's money that goes directly back into the town to, to pay for any potential impacts. A lot of that's focused around education, substance abuse, <coughs> things like that that we see. So there are there are opportunities not only financially but also in, in really community support and bringing something like this into the town. 
So the first couple pages talk about the, the cannabis industry. Um, on slide five, it actually shows the approved licenses by county. I'm just going to point out here that um, in the November uh, picture that they had for Bristol County, they had 19 licenses, and then one month later, they have 21. So this is something that's actively ongoing. Um, as I said, we've been approached. If we go to um, slide seven, I'm going to jump to that just quickly. The, the business opportunities is kind of printed out a little differently too, but the business opportunities that I mentioned, um, you'll see in the far right column the interested parties that we talked to. So we have had somebody who's interested in outdoor cultivation. Um, it's actually a, new, a unique business model that is not only outdoor cultivation, but uh, more of a, a um, social consumption, bed and breakfast type farm and table. So something that was very interesting for the group to hear about. Um, something that obviously we're considering within the bylaw on you know how far do we want to go with with our um, with our zoning um, but a lot of the the focus too is is on the retail so the retail you know we're, we're not a huge town so we're taking into consideration what fits the town's character we're not saying let's jump in and, and just focus on money 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 that's certainly not what we want to do but we've uh, I think we've learned a lot in this process I think too that um, the folks who have come before us have been very informative. You know, we've asked a lot about what do you need so that, that we can make better decisions about what do we consider in our bylaw, not only for what's good for the town, but also what's going to attract people and what's going to keep them here long term. <coughs> um, currently in our bylaws, we account for a registered medical dispensary. We have some um, pretty unique criteria in there that really makes Norton not a friendly town to do business in. Um, we also have Two years ago, we passed to have marijuana within the industrial zones. We've taken no action on that. So one of the things that, that we're doing is we're looking at the existing bylaw. Um, we have, we've been through actually three iterations of the bylaw. Um, we presented and provided the planning for that this week. Uh, they're supportive and we'll continue working with them throughout the process, but you know, certainly expect because this is going to be an article on the board that you'll be hearing more about the process overall. So. Um, if you guys have any specific questions or think that we need to address anything um, holistically from a town perspective, we'd certainly appreciate the input there. Um, we will, you know, we're working with Paul on um, a timeline to understand what do we need to do from a public hearing session, considering what do we want to do from an information session um, on page 10. And I'll have everybody except for one person go to page 10 to look at that side. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but it, it maps out um, several meetings we had. We had different decisions that we've made or the applicants like that we've talked to. Um, it also maps out uh, some of the requirements. So we have to submit the, the article for the, uh, the warrant on February 12th. We want to do something similar and make sure that we have the bio, that we have the zoning available well before the requirements so that we can get them out, get feedback, um, and then just be prepared to, to bring it to town hall and, and feel comfortable with it and, and have folks support it as well. Um, so with that, and I don't want to take up a lot of time, but if there are any immediate questions that I can have? Yes. It's not about the picture. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what are, what are the changes you're looking for? Can you, I don't know, put it in? Common language. We already passed some laws about where they, we can sell marijuana now, just like the industrial park, right? Right. Like what we put. It. Is right. this is this to change that to make it some different places? It's yes. It's okay. to enhance it. So I, I'll just I'll provide you with my own experience. Um, I went to the cannabis convention last March, and I actually sat in on a session about post community agreements. An attorney was was presenting, and one of the things he said was. When you go to a town and you see that they only zone industrial, that means that they don't want you there. And then when you look at our other bylaw about the registered medical dispensary, we have this thousand foot um, criteria in there. Well, you put that in the town holistically and you can go one place. Yep. Right, so I, I think that message is out there and what we want to do is we want to change that message and say, look, we're a town that wants new business and not only from the perspective of just bringing the marijuana industry here, but if you bring that here and people are coming, right, they're gonna go to other places. Right, there's opportunities, I don't want to say to get Norton on the map, but you know, Condine's going to, to be bringing some shops in. Like, if you're in the area, you know how it is now, you go to Mansfield, you get like four or five different stores. So, how do we, how do we kind of build that base here? I think, in think to that? if you're going to do this, you're going to bring it to the town, to, to the town meeting. You've got to have a map yep. to show people, based on our new rule, here's where it can be sold. Straight out now, that's what people want to see. How yeah. close am I going to, where am I going to be able to buy it or sell it? Potentially. 
Right. And I think that when we're talking about trying to convince the town people of a town meeting and to keep it simple. That's, that's simple. it. Yeah. And, and when we talked to the planning board, that was the thing. They said, yeah. you know, prioritize the overlay, the yep. visual overlay. So yeah. we actually, um, as a commission last night, we finished identifying all the properties and now some of the folks on the commission are going through and, and putting that down so that we cool. can come back with an electronic awesome. um, version of that. It was a riveting meeting. But yeah. very exciting going there every was it? That long. <laughs> was it? The, 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 meeting, the meeting before was interesting because we there were uh, certain sections that and, and it's great right I certainly didn't think that we have as much disagreement but it was really good disagreement because we talked about you know their areas and I think everybody knows our zoning is just out there it's it's all over it was done haphazardly it, it doesn't it doesn't serve us justice as a town by any means um, and so when you look at a map like I'll give you an example like reading the, the uh, property um, where Green Barton was formerly it's zoned industrial it's sitting in the middle of a residential area right so we passed a bylaw and said hey go put a, any sort of pot you want there put a warehouse up if you want to right that, that's not something that we want to do in the town so we really took a lot of time and I'm glad it took us several hours to go through to say where do we want this what's the impact going to be how do we make sure I don't want to say that we control it right but one of the big things that, that has come up in every discussion is traffic right and not just traffic about marijuana but think about all the projects between having a drive-through at Dunkin' Donuts, the, the Cumbie station, like everything is traffic, 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 right? So we really are focusing on that too because the retail industry is going to bring a lot of traffic. So we were very um, considerate in what we were looking at from the perspective of where do we want this in town? And, and I hope, you know, that that, that thoughtfulness um, will help gain support to really move forward. Any other questions? Uh, any do you know is there any truth to the rumor that there is a going to be a commercial pot shop in Mansfield Crossing that is according happening. to the Chronicle yeah. there is right yeah it's actually in the presentation so as we put a couple things just like uh, close by so Mansfield has a retail dispensary right? and it's Right now, in the, the Beat Ups Plaza, where um, where the Lord's Link used to be, yes, a exactly. Lot of it's, it's in a great Here. place. I mean, you can get wings, you can get pot, you can go get a massage, some chocolate, <laughs> and then <laughs> and then weigh in at Weight Watchers. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that's going in on Franklin. Franklin's had a cultivation facility in manufacturing, and they just approved the license too for retail. So those are those are close ones to us. Okay, good. And that's in the presentation. So you know the idea that you know I think I think you know part of what you have to overcome is the the idea in some people's minds that this is a radical concept. Um, you know and that, that doing this would place Norton you know outside the bounds of normalcy, whereas really this is would place us yeah, really, in the bounds. Of right. You're right. And we'd have some benefits, you know. Yeah. So certainly welcome any comments or feedback. Like I said, we'll, we'll be back in front of you officially um, as, as part of the warrant for the, the spring meeting. But anything that, uh, that pops up that you think would be valuable to understand or include in the presentation, we're kind of using this as a foundation for the information sessions. So we appreciate anything. And I'm sure now the chair will entertain the motion. <laughs> I'm ready. Um, <laughs> All right. Um, is there any further discussion on that? A motion to adjourn. So, second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Have a great night, everybody.